Welcome to the creative community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is poet, writer, and essayist, Jeffrey Jocks. Welcome. Thank you. Um, we got a lot of stuff to cover, <laughs> Jeffrey. Um, you're someone who's done things in all sorts of different areas. Um, but we're going to start with your poetry. Before we get there, though, I want you to talk to me a little bit about how you became a writer. And part of it is, is growing up in Detroit, right? Um, Almost all of it is okay. about growing up in Detroit. I um, came of age in Detroit in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, and I was uh, fortunate, really, to have run into poetry workshops led by uh, Dudley Randall. I was fortunate to be um, one of the early writers for Cream Magazine, which mm -hmm. was a, a big rock and roll magazine was, at the time. Yeah. And I wrote about. I ran into a, a, a scholar at a conference uh, many years later who told me I was the first person ever to write a, a, a article on Parliament Funkadelic. Oh, wow. So, you know, that was that's that's, probably that's my big. claim to fame <laughs> about that. And I've written for all kinds of other periodicals, yeah. you know, uh, newspapers, magazines, uh, focusing mainly on jazz and blues mm -hmm. music, uh, not so much on rock and roll, even though Cream was a rock and roll yeah. magazine. And I've published poetry. I've been publishing since high school. Well, look, before we get to your poetry, I'm going to go back to Cream magazine because you started writing, you said, when you were 16 years yeah. old. I was reading that a few years later in, mm -hmm. in Sacramento um, as, a, as a young teen. And the writing was just wildly exuberant. And it was also so memorable. There's still some phrases um, that creep back into my head from record reviews that mm -hmm. I read in 1974 or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. That seems like it's good preparation for poetry in a way. It really is. Uh, but the, but the, the thing that was really uh, remarkable at the time, really, was that we had, you know, Cream was part of a whole bunch of periodicals, mm -hmm. of what they called the underground press back right. then. And, you know, they were real newspapers. And, you know, as a teenager, you could get real good training in journalism. Mm -hmm. And so it was a remarkable thing. I still have, I spent many years as a labor journalist in New York, and I still have notebooks full of my interviews. And mm -hmm. sometimes I go in there and grab out phrases for poems. Uh, you learn a lot about language, just how language works, how it dances, really. Mm -hmm. And that's got one of the things you have to know as a poet is how to make language dance. Yeah, and so how do you do that? <laughs> well, you listen to a lot of language. Okay, that's one thing you do, and you um, y you listen to how it makes meaning, how it sounds, because mm -hmm. sometimes the meaning of something and the way it sounds are some somewhat divergent. Mm -hmm. uh, you. You know, you listen to a lot of, I listen to a lot of song lyrics, mm -hmm. not just pop songs from, you know, my youth or contemporary, but also going back into uh, early um, pop music. And Gershwin or Gersh something like yeah, that. Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, and then you just read a whole lot of poetry. You do, yeah. I mean, just, you know, I probably have, I have hundreds of poetry books. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of them I've had since I was in high school. Right. And, you know, you just read them, and you read them over, and you read them over, and you keep reading them, you know. I think that it's almost impossible to be a poet if you don't read a lot of poetry. Right. It's like any other art form. Well, and, you know, as a, someone who teaches poetry to college students, I'll find sometimes they'll say, well, I don't want to be influenced by someone. But to me... That's just the starting point, you know. If you're not influenced, then then you you haven't even really gotten the game yet. Well, the thing is, you're you're, you're entering conversation, right. and you got to learn how to talk, right? And you know, sometimes it's just that you have to, 
in some ways you have to own your influences. Uh, you know, the great poets all own their influences. Right. You know, they don't talk about, oh, I don't want to sound like, you know, so-and-so. They own that. And then they make their version of that. And if you do it with, you know, with yourself, because the other thing that you have to, uh, that's important about being a poet is you have to know that part of it is about self-discovery. Mm -hmm. You know, it's discovering your voice, discovering your relation to language discovering, you know, what your, uh, how the images and sounds that you want to put forth come from you, you know, how you see the world. Mm -hmm. And y part of the way you learn that is by reflecting off how others see the world, you know, because it's all a conversation. It's a great conversation. It is. Well, and since we're talking about that conversation, maybe we could hear one of your poems and yes. then you could talk a little bit about uh, um, This is a it. poem that, um, I'm lucky enough to have uh, this, is, this just thing that's just sort of happened. Somebody um, d asked me for a poem to publish. They publish it. He publishes these in Happy Monks Press. Publishes these in uh, 25 editions of 25. Okay. So it's a broadside. <laughs> it's a broadside, um, which is uh, I could go into a long story about broadsides, but I'd rather read "Murmured <laughs> in the Ear." <laughs> Murmured in the ear. A flaming benefit covered a lot of ground with that expansive education nobody could afford, commemorating the bloomed orchid in an abandoned hallway. You added a controlled apology, choreographed, while an early description could just force its way aboard, and in that condition you were directly interested in who did and who did not report the lights, pushing the quiet critic who incredibly found his hands beneath the air. We thought you were open and excited in a necessary way, in a helpful manner, in a non-pushy way, in a way that guided us down the path we've traveled along here recently in a sleepy but predictable order of magnitude. Someone fell into the visual language and groped for the notice about the hovering subject dumbly repeating the tale of the lion and the unicorn while, while a mind complex is due tomorrow and the creature in reality berated a loose formation. With a purpose that caught the investment as the room began to fill in the civilized countries with their cheap clothes under the tree canopy of his mind dappled like a twilight apartment. And to think logically requires looking at a reflection in order to worm your way into the easily governed, slow-moving game of checkers that permeates the economic edifice across the gulf that separates the thoughtful from the dry work. There were two jujus in that period, one flat, one larger. And the sightings all began where a minor distinction brought a reality to bear on a shape mirroring a top or the drone of traffic or a word murmured in the ear. Actually, the truth had been a grinding flash of emotion that pointed to a familiar door, closed against the corridor, orange like your garment, drawing thousands of gestures, fondly pouting. The appearance of wind becomes a phrase, a typical large tree, commonly handing, handing them over to a closed radar ping, a state of affairs that can hardly be read as an unspoken thought, a riddled driveway bonding witness. In an ever-changing environment, the surveillance would have recognized the shaking bright light that apparently can be attributed to an unarguable report tailored to an overrun in the craft, a full-length property that could be used for eating or for attention to the program, and the second of a series turns your mouth toward the window with the power to work the lifted brow and the inclination to claim the fact squeezed between, repeated, re between a repeated message, its function, and the back-and-forth set of demands that have nothing to do with what goes on during the free hour. However, witness from the beginning, your first pas de deux collapsed, leaving all the drift. Thereafter, you could have made it possible for a moment to merge with a boom of thunder and the rose-colored privilege, and that act confused air materiel into granting a practical waiver, classic, refined, 
alien but cool, able to penetrate the laughter that grew from the calm environs without alarm, make allowances for the breakable, and demonstrate that you're better off with, that, with the mercurial cook imitating avoidable trouble in the, in the anger stage popping in another the condition of a laughing hermit. But either way, your move could be electric without wreckage, a wonder nearly offhand, a compliment. Wow. <laughs> There's a line in there, alien but cool. And <laughs> I would say that that, that sort of, um, for me, summarizes a poem that's really complex and dense. You were talking earlier about owning your influences. As you read that out loud, who were the kind of poets from your past that uh, kind of Well, I, I uh, learned, my first sort of textbook really was the um, Donald Allen anthology, mm -hmm. The New American Poets and the um, Arna Bontomps anthology, American Negro Poetry. Mm -hmm. Together, those were like my first big things. And then Whitman, mm -hmm. and then Ginsburg, mm -hmm. and then Mary Baraka, mm -hmm. Langston Hughes, Gwendolyn Brooks. So, you know, kind of went all over that, and then I discovered the Surrealists in the middle of all that. Um, and translation, of course. I didn't read French in high school and barely got to, was able to read it anywhere. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, there's a Congolese poet named Chikea Yutamsi who I fell in love with okay. in, in my, when I was in high school. And he was a, a, f from the Congo, uh, had been a diplomat, but also was a fairly um, re highly respected poet. And um, Aimé Césaire. Sure. And uh, mm -hmm. André Breton. Uh -huh. And and among the beats, Philip Lamentia. Okay. So, you know, it goes from that's a <laughs> you know, that's a lot of influences moving their influence. way through there. Well, if you if you if you start by reading anthologies, you have a lot of influences. <laughs> yep, right from know. the start. Yeah. And then at some point or other, I fell in love with Yeats, mm -hmm. and that became a thing. That's a whole different. Uh, the, the, um, it is in some ways, and and not in others. Yeah. How yeah. how does how does Yeats work in a poem like that? Um, well, there's. Uh, there's the, 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 I was going to say the love of language for language's mm -hmm, sake, mm -hmm. which is all through Yeats. There's the, you know, Yeats accesses the, um, the supernatural, mm -hmm. which is in what, not unrelated to states of, um, you know, hallucinat hallucinatory states mm -hmm. and visionary states and that sort of thing. And from there, you get the ability to, the surrealists have this thing of you know, putting two uh, objects together that don't seem like they go together, right. and they make a new thing. And so you work with those kinds of principles, and you come up with all kinds of ways of thinking of language. You know? well, and so in a, in a poem like uh, Murmured in the Ear, um, it, it, I'm in the poem. I'm moving out. I, I'm doing a lot of this with my <laughs> with my hands. Inevitably, I think that's that's part of what it wants me to do. It also seems to insist that I come back to it again and again because it's it's not something that reveals itself on on first reading. I wouldn't. Think. Well, no. I mean, I think the thing, you know, it, it, the, the, Philip Whalen has this saying. Uh, the beat poet Philip Whalen. He has this saying of um, the poem is a graph of the mind moving, hmm. and. You know, if you're really trying to get at how, you're trying to make a work of art out, you know, that reflects that, then what you're doing is you're not uh, pausing for the censor. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not, you know, you're not looking for the censor that's going to make this one image after the other after the other. Um, you're not going to impose something on it. You want to try to reveal it. Mm -hmm. And so here, you know, I just sort of, I, I, I write down phrases, and then when I sit, when I get ready to put them all together, I try to just put them together in a way that makes grammatical sense, mm -hmm. right? And then, um, you know, you get into uh, the state of your, whatever that state of your mind is. When you're speaking, or when you're writing the poem, when the poem emerges, as it does, from this process we call creative, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, it emerges as an object, or ought to emerge as a kind of object in itself. Okay. You know, and you know, people have 
all kinds of ideas about what's supposed to make sense. But I always tell people, you know, um, things go better with Coke really doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know, most advertising <laughs> slogans make, make no sense. sense. Yeah, right. But right. there, there's some intuitive sense that, that we're, or we're maybe we're grafting it on top of we it. We make yeah. it up. Yeah, right. And that's okay. Yeah. That's fine. But that means that you're involved in uh, making the language object. Right. You know, it's not a thing that's just feeding you. You know, you're involved. You're, you have to engage yourself with it. And, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a big jazz fan, right? So if you really are thinking about what jazz musicians are doing, they're, um, a lot of them, not everyone is like this, but a lot of them are like this, they're not asking for your permission. Mm -hmm. You know, they're doing what they're doing, and they have, um, most of the time, the issues they're dealing with are simply, you know, kind of bedrock issues of how to make music better. But what comes out is a thing that is, you know, um, a, a, an object of itself. I always, every semester in my creative writing class, I'll play part of um, A Love Supreme mm -hmm. um, or Ascent by John Coltrane, which sure. is even wilder. Uh, right. You know, there's maybe 10 musicians playing at the right. same time. Ascension, sure. There, there's moments when uh, it pauses and there's a soloist and then everybody comes back in. Um, but there is, somehow it's connected and yet it sounds on first listen to be right. wildly you know, chaotic. So you have to, so that, I'm glad you mentioned John Coltrane, because he's also very important to my aesthetic. Um, he has an album like Ascension uh, called Ohm that I used to listen to repeatedly, mm -hmm. and it was, you know, um, it was the, this, uh, a trip all of itself, mm -hmm. right? But it was also this marvelous work of art in which things that don't seem to go together actually go together mm -hmm. and make something, mm -hmm. you know? And that's um, a great deal of what that music was about. We only have 10 minutes left. <laughs> I, want to, I want to hear some more poems from you. I know you have a, a sonnet sequence. Um, yeah. And we, we mentioned Yeats, so that's a, I can uh, uh, sort of fit him back in a little bit more here. Um, tell us a little bit. Uh, you're going to read, I think, three yeah. pieces. Um, tell, us, tell us what this, the sequence is about overall. So this is called On an Imperial Order, Gasping for Air, and it's not finished. Um, I don't know how long it'll end up being, but um, let's see. I want to read. This is actually a kind of response to the times we're in. Okay. So it's a very didactic and political kind of poem. And so I'm only going to read, I'm not going to read the numbered numbers of the sections, but just read three sections from it. Take the last time we were out together. You said perfection was the best of all virtues. I said that we love flowers even if they are not perfect. In matters of statecraft, perfection is always elusive. Hear the ancient poet and learn the truth. Virtue is feeble, while vice is dreadful. And, we can add, imp imperfection is your inheritance. Rain can, grant bo can both grant and take life. When the sky clears and new hope arrives, we plant seed and wait for life anew. It is a deep vice to junk this process. Yet one guy's delusion of perfection is all it takes to wreck a pretty thing. The propertied and moneyed have always sought to jail those that commit the crime of socialism. It can be an awful thing, housing the sick and healing the homeless, wanting to talk instead of bully, wanting to say, you can't poison folks for a few dollars more just to please your friends, like that foul air outbreak down the street last week, last year. And who ever heard of water dirtied on purpose? just so we can pay you for the right to drink. Just think of it, quote, nobody's got the right to clean water, unquote. And just when everybody's wondering what is meant by the word socialism. And this is the last one. This is my the 4th of July sonnet. Okay. A human body falls from the sky and lands in the garden. Tanks will roll through the Capitol at the USA's Freedom Day party. I won't be there. 
He's jailing people who are pursuing liberty, the right to life, to happiness. The day after tanks roll down the D.C. streets, he's throwing out millions of American families. Who can ex-polls lobby for? That's called news. How about lobby for the sick, not for the profit makers? In my head an echo, that D.C. guy from back in the day, to the slave, what, he said, is the 4th of July. We'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. It's got like 24 parts right now, yeah. so I'm hoping it'll grow. Well, and, and it's, it's a poem that is, as you said, directly political. Uh, it's, uh, you're expressing outrage and uh, disbelief. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess those are the appropriate emotions. I think disbelief is a very healthy um, uh, thing to have in a moment where unbelievable things happen. You know, and uh, the and sometimes there are unbelievable things that are um, good things, but sometimes there are unbelievable things that are really you know like dystopian. Mm -hmm. And you know, disbelief is a healthy emotion. Yeah. You know, we shouldn't accept that kind of thing. So what role do you think poetry has in in helping us? Is it just to express that disbelief? Do you think poetry changes things? I mean, there are obviously plenty well, of poems that have done that. I think, I think at certain moments, you know, it's not so much that poems change things, but poems give us our, our sort of markers of things that are changing or about to change okay. sometimes. And those are hard to, it happens, but it doesn't always happen, um, you know, with any predictability. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's no thing about p that we can say about poems being sort of an avatar of, you know, uh, or a reflection of much else than the individual poets responding to response. that response. Yeah. And but it is very interesting that, uh, and we go into a whole thing about you know how it is that the arts um, no longer simply justify the powerful but are really in some ways in opposition mm -hmm. to uh, especially powers that are um, controversial or powers that are um, harmful. Uh, we see a, we've seen a lot of that over the last hundred years, last couple of hundred mm -hmm. years. And that's something that is about our era, I think, broadly speaking era. Yeah, it's a change because for centuries the arts did justify the powerful. In right, one, one and we praised the another. powerful, we justified the powerful, and you can see a change in that, um, you know, beginning basically around the time of the American Revolution. You know, I'm teaching class this uh, fall and uh, about black women writers, and one of the things I'll introduce is Phyllis Wheatley, uh, one of the works of people's works I'll introduce is Phyllis Wheatley, who I talk about as the poet of the American Revolution. And her work is exactly both things. You know, they're both, she both, you know, says things that are, that can be said, that be taken as affronts to the powerful, mm -hmm. as well as writing poems to countesses, right. you know, who, who were, who she wanted as patrons. We just have a few minutes left. I would love to go back to your first book and, and hear a poem from that. Um, oh. Would, would you? This is actually not my first. It's actually uh, fairly recent, not fairly recent, but it's most the first, recent book. most recent. Well, and it's a full that. length um, collection called uh, Just for a Thrill. Uh, the title comes from a song by Lil Hart and Armstrong. Uh, Louis Armstrong, one of Louis Armstrong's wives, okay. who was also a very big figure in, in jazz, and especially in Chicago in the late 20s. This is called The Fall of Vietnam. The mountain goats of Montana shed their coats. Good for the mountain goats of Montana. The symbol of our presence in Vietnam. If we can't prevent the embassy from being captured by God, what are we there for? The faded whites of their wedding gowns. Is that the right number? A ticklish subject design writing research, the learned and affable meeting of frequent academies, and some fatty sweat for you. I could sit through you, all your lies missing you, but I still don't have a good hat. 
I want to be vamped by you, just you and nobody else but you. That's not quite right. Kill the flies. Then change the stinking yellow pillowcase. I don't have $100 to be dropping on 40 minutes. My hunch it's a gate, is it's a gateway thing. 13 months, 14 days, $300 million a day. Do you remember? Will you return? We never did get the two Hueys straight. What I most want is people arguing on the sidewalk. Mm. <laughs> well, so you wouldn't notice, but there are quotes in there from not just the blues, but from Milton and from, uh, um, I forget who else. Yeah, I, I heard some lyric from the, the 30s. In the yeah, video. and the yeah. lyric from the 30s, a lyric from I, Cole Porter, I think. Yeah. Yeah. In our final two minutes together, I mean, you've been, you're, you're a professor and, and you've been giving a lot of advice, but I always like to finish my interviews with the, the guest sort of giving advice to aspiring artists in their field. So for writers, journalists, but mostly for poets, what could you say in 90 seconds <laughs> that, um, that might be good advice for people? Read as much poetry as you can yeah. from all the, um, from every country. Okay. Read as deeply into whatever tradition you, you know, your, whatever is close to your family, your community, whatever that is. Read as deeply into that as possible. Read as deeply into the, into the language of poetry as possible. Um, you'll find some surprising things. You'll find um, uh, affinities between medieval poets and hip hop records. Mm -hmm. You'll find all kinds of stuff. So just read as deeply as possible. So you need to be wide open to whatever you find. Yourself. Wide open and read them in books. Okay. That's the other thing I would say. Read them Don't in books. Don't read it on your phone? <laughs> Not at first. Okay. Not at first. Go to the library, get the old books and read the old books. Okay. Because that's, you know, I published this in a book, right? And books are things that people make, objects. And, you know, it's... Um, it's a great thing to do. And if you had some more time, I'd quote Ezra Pound about it, but I think we're well, I think heading we're just out. <laughs> about a time. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for Thank being you. on the show. Mm -hmm. The Creative Community is produced in Ventura with the help of Phil Taggart and his crew. I'm David Starkey, and thanks for watching.